Um, but thanks to everyone for joining this morning. It's a beautiful morning here in Otter Tail County. We're getting really lucky with some weather uh, in, in mid-December here. So I uh, appreciate you taking time out of your day to join us for one of our, our, our December quarterly workforce convening. Um, just to kind of give you a, what the plan for the day, uh, many of you are probably familiar with our format already, but um, we'll do a quick just run through of our OTC works uh, workforce strategy that we use here at the county um, when thinking about all of our workforce efforts. Um, and then we've got three speakers, just like we, we typically do on our convenings um, that we host quarterly. So we've got uh, Ray from DEED, who's gonna talk about um, some new resources coming out here from DEED. Um, Josh Hansen is gonna is our partner on the talent tourism, which we actually talked about at our convening last time. Um, but in follow up to that, we have a couple of other tools and resources um, that Josh is gonna share. Um, and then Debbie Grant from Rural Minnesota SEP uh, will kind of provide an overview and an introduction um, to an, a newer program that they have launched here in the in the past um, few months as well. Um, and then as always, we'll have some time for Q&A and discussion at the end. Um, so say, you know, if you have questions for speakers, feel free to drop them in the chat, um, hold on to them. Um, I'll also give a little bit of, you know, short notice between each of our speakers if you have any really pressing questions that you want to ask right away. So um, with that, just to, to give you an overview of the, the OTC Works workforce strategy. So as a reminder, um, we use we use this strategy in all of our workforce efforts. Um, OTC obviously standing for Otter Tail County, um, but also standing for uh, opportunities, training and connections. Um, and each of those um, kind of words aligns with one of the three action areas that we use when we're thinking about workforce and how the county can be uh, making a difference when it comes to workforce challenges and workforce efforts. Um, so kind of that first action area, um, talking about opportunities. So promoting the availability of jobs with family sustaining wages, um, and then some of those resources that are available throughout the county. That second action area there is training, so helping our employers, making sure our employers are promoting their opportunities and, and recruiting and retaining um, in the most effective way for them. And then the third action area, which is where we at the county spend a bulk of our time, is, is connections and partnerships. So creating those partnerships to improve occupational readiness, reduce some of those barriers to employment that folks have, and then also thinking about um, aligning skills for future workforce needs and our youth and, and you know, folks that are coming into the workforce here in the next couple of years. Um, so that's kind of how we, we talk about uh, all of our workforce efforts. Um, so to kick things off, um, talking about an opportunity here, we've got uh, Ray McCoy, who is a, a program coordinator at DEED, um, and I will let him introduce himself as well. Um, but just to kind of provide a background, so I think on, it was either our last workforce convenings or, or two of them ago, um, we did hear from uh, Lori Sanders here at the county about working or hiring individuals with disabilities. And so, um, Hearing that on a past convening, wanted to continue to provide some resources. Um, this this uh, employer reasonable accommodation fund is a new resource for employers, and so we have Ray here to kind of just provide a an introduction and an overview of that resource and share some of the the good things that are going to come out of that. So, Ray, I will turn it over to you. I don't know if you have slides that you want to share. I can stop I sharing and I okay. Yep. So I will stop sharing. I'll let you take control, um, and I will turn it over to you. All right, thank you very much. So as stated, my name is Ray McCoy and I'm the program coordinator here for the Employer Reasonable Accommodation Fund. And with me is Lindsay Hansen, our, um, who supervises the program along with other programs here at State Services for the Blind. So in addition to me talking, you also hear some other stuff from Lindsay as well. And Lindsay, if you wanna say hi, like introduce yourself, for yourself and give a little bit more of an overview of what your roles are. 
Sure. Hi, good morning, everybody. Thank you for having us today. Yes, as Ray said, I'm the program manager for uh, ERAF. We call it the Employer Reasonable Accommodation Fund. We call it ERAF. It's just less, less of a mouthful, right? Um, so we uh, this is a pilot program new to the state of Minnesota. We are um, the only one in the nation with this pilot program, and it launched. And Ray's going to get into a little bit about this, but we're really, really excited. So happy to meet with you guys. I just want to let you guys know, if you have any questions throughout this presentation, please feel free to ask. We want to answer your questions today. We want to make sure that you guys feel confident and comfortable about communicating this out with employers and other partners that you have about this program. So I'll send it back to you, Ray. And if you guys have right. any questions, please give us a shout. All right. Sounds good. So what this is, as was explained, the two-year pilot program that was, that was um, basically given, we were allocated funding through the legislature. So two million per fiscal year. So next year the funding will renew itself. So how it works is two million less 300 for budgeted administrative costs, which means we have $1.7 million that we can reimburse businesses for. And what our goal is to, as also mentioned, is to promote the hiring of people with disabilities by reducing any sort of, sort of perceived or real financial hardships that may be preventing them for providing accommodations for any sort of employer or employee or applicant with a disability. So with that being said, our, this is available to small to medium sized employers, which I'll get into in a little bit. And we are a D program that is housed within state services for the blind and so then just actually launched when I say this is new, we launched September 1st. So we're really trying to get the word out there and everything. So going forward, this for to be an eligible employer, a business has to have less than 500 employees and generate less than 5 million in gross or annual revenue and obviously be domiciled in Minnesota. So what we tried to do is keep it quite simple, not too many like what you'll see throughout this presentation is like there's not a lot of red tape, not a lot of hoops to jump through because we want this process to be easy and convenient for employers to provide these services to employees. So, you know, kind of moving forward. So overall, while really any sort of reasonable accommodation that a business has to come out of pocket for that is meant for the employee or the applicant is something that could be grounds for reimbursement. So, you know, again, while I won't go through these verbatim, these are just some examples of things that, you know, are ultimately are things that we would reimburse the employer for. So, for example, our very first application which we approved was for an ergonomic workstation for a couple of their employees and on the back end they came back and asked like if they needed if they like they could alter the interior website the internal website because the external one was accessible to you know everybody wide range whether they had a disability or not but the internal website or the internal internet was not so when we found out, yep, that's something that could be an accommodation is for people who, for a couple of their employees who are visually impaired, they were able to hire somebody to update the website as needed internally for employees, and we were able to reimburse them for that cost. So again, kind of giving a broad overview, and again, I don't know if you want to add something else to that, Lindsay. Yeah, I'd like to um, add a little bit more about that. So like um, Ray had mentioned, so even though we are right now, we're housed in at State Services for the Blind, Blind, this pilot project, it is a deed program, right? We just needed a venue to launch the program and we raised our hand at State Services for the, for the Blind. We'll say, we can do this, right? So in the applicant for our first applicant for ERAF that Ray was just referencing, it was a really, um, it was kind of a cool learning situation for us because we are learning as employers are learning about the program. They're saying, asking us questions and like, well, we hadn't thought about that before. So when the business owner said, hey, our public facing website is accessible, but we have employees who are um, who are blind and they can't access it to from the back end to work on the website. And that's their job. We need to migrate this to a new platform. OK, well. I don't know anything about 
migrating platforms for accessibility, but I know who does, and that's one of our technologists at State Services for the Blind, which actually I work for State Services for the Blind. I've been there since 2006, so I've been there a long time, so I know who to talk to. So I pulled in one of our technologists and connected him with the employer, and they had a great discussion, and we found out that, yeah, that indeed will meet their needs and meet the employee's needs. So we said, we are going to move forward, and if you go ahead, purchase the migration to this new website, we will reimburse you that cost. So it was really, really cool to have that consultation making sure that not only is it meeting the employer's needs and what they need to have, but also it met the person's needs with a disability. So everybody won out of that and we were able to reimburse that cost. So that's just yep. an example of how we consult with employers when they're not sure either. So go ahead, Ray. Yep. And we'll go into how the process works with the consultation here in a minute. So with limits, we are able to reimburse a business, an eligible business of up to 30,000 per fiscal year. So this encapsulates both one-time and ongoing accommodations. And with that being said, being that this is a two-year pilot program, one thing I want to point out is that let's say that they still need some sort of ongoing or more reasonable accommodations within the second fiscal year. Well, then guess what? We can reimburse that same business up to another 30000 for that second year. So for one-time expenses or one-time accommodations, they cannot be any less than $250 and any more than $15,000 per individual with a disability. So to kind of break this down, because that could be a little bit confusing, let's say I'm an employer and I'm hiring or I have just hired somebody who is in a wheelchair and needs ramps. So I need ramps put in my business in front as well as via the emergency exit. The front ramp costs $17,000 while the rear ramp costs 10,000. So what happens is that I get reimbursed from ERAF 15,000 at max for that seven for that um $17,000 ramp. So I have to still pay 2,000 out of pocket. And then for that other ramp in the back that's 10,000, I get the full 10,000, leaving me with $5,000 left if I need any sort of additional reasonable accommodations throughout the fiscal year. All right. So with that being said, submissions for ongoing accommodation expenses, there are no minimum or maximum requirements. So it could be, for example, like if you had a job coach and they charged 40, 50 an hour, that's fine. If you had somebody as a sign language interpreter and they would say that they only charged you $100 per, you know, whatever, per week, then that's fine. As long as you realize that with this with this program, once the expenses add up to 30,000, then once they cap out at 30,000, we cannot reimburse you again until the next fiscal year. So really wanted to touch on the reimbursement limits here. And so kind of going back to the application steps and getting a little bit more into what Lindsay was talking about, about the consultation. So this is kind of like how these how this process would be. The employee completes their internal process confirming their disability and need for accommodations, even though there could be times where they don't know what accommodations are needed. They know what their disability is, but they don't necessarily know what type of accommodation might be best suited for them, or they might have an idea, but who knows? That's where the consultation comes in. So we, I really stress that this consultation will be something, and I'll get into more of this here later on in the show, how we can help the employee get a better understanding of, yep, there's this, there's that, there's this at your disposal that you could use and whatnot, and try to really clear up any questions they have and make sure that whatever is being purchased is something that we can approve before you purchase it because we don't want you to get blindsided by this as an employer. So let's say everything works out. They, you know, have an understanding. He's like, yep, we'll approve that. They'll go ahead and purchase the reasonable accommodation for the applicant or employee. And then at that point, that's when they complete the application on our site. So when completing this, the only thing we ask for, I mean, this is how easy it is. We don't ask for any sort of verification of somebody's disability. We're not going to ask for like financials to make sure that your business is within guidelines or whatnot. The only thing that's needed with the application are proofs of purchase for the simple fact that we need to know how much do how much can we reimburse you and for what. So within that, within five days, 
I will review the application to make sure that it fits. If approved, then we'll be sent to our ERAF technician who will reach out to the employer to complete all the forms, substitute W-9 and SWIFT, especially if anticipating future reimbursements. And they will walk through this process with them as needed to make sure that they're on the right track. With reimbursements, well, this is one thing that's unique about, you know, government program. A lot of programs, it takes a little longer for reimbursements or even like, you know, money to be dispersed. Here, we want, we send out this within 30 days. So, again, I don't know if you want to touch on any other pieces here, Lindsay, or if I cover the whole thing. I think the, the one thing, no, Ray, you did a great job. One thing that is really important just to help people understand is any funding and support they get through ERAF is not going to impact any other programs or funding streams or agencies or any other supports they're getting elsewhere. These are completely separate programs. And we have um, money allotted that we want to give to employers. We want employers to take this money as it falls within the parameters of this program. And we have, that's why the application is raised that is so easy. We don't require all this front end documentation from the employer. It's on our website. We have Q&A on our website and Ray will share all that information. So we really are trying to make this a, not a red tapey kind of government program. We are trying to make this easy for employers that um, they can access it and see a quick turnaround with the money after they make a purchase. Cause we know for small, medium sized businesses, purchases can be tough. So we want you them to know that they will get this money back quickly as soon as they submit the information to us. All right. Yep. So going forward here. So straightforward as Lindsay said, you know, we want to make this as easy as possible, but we also want to be as upfront as possible. So clear cut and dry, here's some potential reasons for, you know, why we might deny them. Again, so like looking at the second one, saying that there's like not a qualifying reasonable accommodation under, you know, definition of state law. One of the applicants we had actually purchased a vehicle for an employee with a disability to help them get to and from work. And while and transportation is something that cannot be covered under this program due to the fact that it is not under the definition necessarily of a reasonable accommodation. So when we denied them, we try to make sure that they have an understanding of that. And what we conveyed is that let's say that they wanted to do some sort of modifications so that, you know, let's say that their applet or their employee had was in a wheelchair but still needed to do some run some errands for the company in the company car yep we can make modifications to that company vehicle or we would be able to cover those under this program to where they would be able to do so so that the employee could do their job but again we wanted to be really clear about that when we reached out to them to say, hey, this doesn't work, but if you wanted to do this and this and this, you could. So it's not a, another thing that's great is that we don't just turn you away and say, yep, sorry, we can't help you, you know, best of luck. We don't want to sound cold and what have you. So another one that has come up a lot, actually, since we've really launched the program was a some sort of accommodation they might have or something that's not necessarily for a job applicant or an employee with a disability. So a lot of, there have been a few businesses that have called. They stated that we have made our building ADA compliant, which is great. And uh, they said, hey, we're anticipating future needs for people like to try to hire people with disabilities. Well, that's great. But if it is not, if that accommodation is not tied to a current employee or an applicant with a disability, regardless if it does make ADA compliance, which is what we want, you know, but if it's not tied to that, then we cannot approve it. Okay. So again, just really straightforward. I won't read the rest of this verbatim, but to go into that, regardless of why an employer is denied, they're providing an appeal process because, again, there could be more to the story than they have conveyed. 
that may not make sense or they just, you know, feel like they really need to state a case of why they feel they should, you know, they qualify for the program. So, Lindsay, I think you took your mic off. Want to say something? Yeah, I was going to just um, comment. Another reason we denied an application. One of the things that are, are it's, a, it's a hard um a hard line is the dates. So anything that was purchased prior to July 1, so even though the, the program launched September 1, we can go back as far as July 1 and provide reimbursements for employers um, to accommodate, provide accommodations for um, applicants or employees with disabilities. So back to July 1, we had an applicant that made a purchase in June and we had to deny them because that is, we know there's, there's a lot of flexibility in this program but that is a hard line as far as dates go. It has to be within the fiscal year. So we had to deny that. And of course we explained why, um, but there are some things that we cannot waver on, but that's an example of when we had to deny that we couldn't really give an explanation other than it was a hard line with the date. Yeah. So, and then going forward here, again, won't repeat from this verbatim, but as me and Lindsay have said several times, there is not a lot of red tape within this program and within the application. Again, the only thing that an employer needs to submit is basically the proof of purchases through either a receipt or cancel check, which has the name of the purchase and whatnot. So, or not a cancel check, but a check stub. <laughs> so with that being said, let's say that, like, wait, with that being said, we just want to make sure that we get those things because we need to know again how much we can reimburse an employer so also going on the front end we want to make sure and again i sound like a broken record by saying this that this is an easy process and that's one that anybody can access however going forward with that let's say you know we'll be conducting financial audits for reimbursements of the reimbursements that we have. And if an employer does not meet all the requirements, they may be required to return a portion of all the funds they receive through the audit. So again, going back, we don't ask for those bits and pieces up front, but when on the application, there's a section where the employer kit like basically certifies, yep, I am a small to medium sized business. I fit within these guidelines. I am signing my name on the dotted line that I'm doing so. And that's what we use as saying, yep, they stated that they were a small to medium sized business and that they qualify for the ERAF program because they fit within the in the guidelines that are set. All right. So I don't know if I missed anything or not, Lindsay, or I'm good to go. No, I don't I don't think you missed anything there. It, like it, like we really want people to take advantage of this program. So we do not want to have a lot of um, hoops to jump through or anything like that. Another reason we denied somebody is they put in a contract for a service they want to provide for an employee. And we said, that's great. However, you've not provided the service. This is a contract for the cost of the service. So if you do intend to go ahead and provide this service, then you pay for the service, you can submit for reimbursement. That was actually an ongoing, that was for job coaching, which is considered an ongoing expense. So that could be um, something that we could have provided uh, reimbursement for. So those are examples where somebody might submit something. We say, no, but this is why, and this is how we can make it work. So we try to be very um, open and have a very transparent communication with the employer saying, how can you access these funds? So going forward here, going back to the consultation piece, again, like I said, this is something that's no extra cost to employers. And what we want to make sure ultimately is that we have a game plan set in place with them that any sort of reasonable accommodations they purchase or what they feel that they're purchasing for the employee or applicant is something that they'll know beforehand if it will be approved or denied so that they don't get blindsided within this. But other things that we do, that we might do within the consultation are to give them some more understanding of the ADA as it pertains to the employee's rights or the applicant's rights versus like the, actually the employer's rights under this act. So that along with 
hey, they might want to increase or expand their knowledge on different disability related issues or whatnot. So what we would do is that we connect them to different trainings and resources, both within and outside of D to help them better navigate the situation. And of course, clear up the air with any sort of questions or whatnot they might have. But really with this consultation, we try to get into the core to make sure that, yep, this is a good game plan, go for it. Or we might suggest some other pieces too that might be helpful to the employer along with what they were initially trying to do, so. Um, Ray, I'm going to add to that a lot in these consultations. We learn so much and we learn really great questions. Like, for example, one of the questions was, is this OK for a migrant and seasonal workers? Yes. Yes, it is. Is it OK for temporary um, uh, workers or somebody who has is, um, let's say somebody went out on a um, for a surgery, for example, we have somebody that um, went out for a surgery and the employer said, OK, this person cannot work, um, come back to the office and work. They have to work from home as they recover for their surgery. It, can you guys help with that? Why, well, yes, yes, we can. So it's those kind of things that when an employer asks us a question, we go back to the statute and we look at it and say, what can we help with? Because we want to help employers. And so we want, we invite questions because that makes us really dig into the statute and be like, with the hopes of always going back and saying, well, yes, yes, we can help with that. Um, so that's why these consultations are so informative for the employer, but for us too, because we, it really opens our eyes in, in the many ways we can reach out and help people. And so in turn, helping the person with a disability go in and get that job. Yep. So, yeah, and one thing that, you know, I want to point out for this is that we are the only state so far that's doing something like this. This is a unique opportunity that I feel if really, really shared right and really taken advantage of by employers can change the game and level the playing field for people with disabilities. And that's why we're really gung-ho about and excited about getting this out there to the public. So again, we are able to present to any employers, staff partners, or anybody else that, you know, who could benefit from this information. One thing that I'll do at the end of this presentation is include our flyer, as well as a copy of the presentation and our contact information. Because again, this program, we feel, and especially within different sorts of employment counseling and really placements can help with like making sure that placements are longer term or permanent, especially when working with persons with disabilities to get them placed. So again, I don't know if you wanted to touch any on anything else, but. Um, I just want to, um, in honesty, really, I want to see if there's any questions that we can um, uh, answer for anybody. I know Ray's going to put the flyer out and, and put some resources in the chat for everybody, but do you guys have any questions for us right now? Yeah, great information, you guys. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, like Lindsay said, if you do have any questions, feel free to drop those in the chat. We can also save those for the very end if things are if that was a lot of information and you've got more um, more thoughts to put together and have a question for later on when we maybe have some time. Um, we'll also, Ray, will you send these slides to for us to share as well? Yes. Perfect. Yep. So we'll distribute these slides as in our in our follow up too. So great information um, and appreciate, like you guys said, the transparency and and hopefully this this process is really easy for employers to take advantage of. So. Um, with that, if we don't have any questions, I think we'll move on to our, our next speaker. Um, and Ray, if you've got things that you want to drop in the chat now, feel free to go ahead and do that. All right. Thank you guys again. All right. So we're going to move on to our next speaker. Um, like I said on the front end, um, Josh Hansen is joining us. So Josh, um, if you remember back to the last quarter, if you joined us for uh, for our workforce convening, Eric Osberg, our Rural Rebound Initiative Coordinator, kind of provided a, a preview of um, our talent tourism program that Ottertail Lakes Country led um, to provide some, some 
career awareness and, and lifestyle awareness opportunities for students that are attending school down in the in the in the Twin Cities. Um, so Josh was our partner on that and he is also a, a grad student down at the U of M. Um, and so brings kind of that student but also career center and how are we planning for uh, for graduation and where kit, you know, where students want to pursue career opportunities. Um, so Josh is a really great connection to to the U of M, um, but also brings that student perspective and and has some information here to share about Handshake. Um, and I'll turn it over to Josh to kind of give his presentation. Thanks for joining us, Josh. Yeah, hey, thanks, Sarah. Um, yeah, so hey, everybody, I'm Josh Hansen Connell. Um, I'm a second year MBA at the Carlson School of Management at the University of Minnesota. Uh, so I grew up in Montevideo, Minnesota, a small town about two hours south of y'all. Um, if you know it, um, we're big enough that we show up on the weather maps about half the time, but small enough that I still cheer when we do. Um, so, uh, yeah, but now I live in St. Paul where I'm attending school, but, um, really, really close to my roots and really wants to, uh, figure out ways to create better connections between, uh, the seven county metro and rural, uh, Minnesota. And what I'm focusing on right now is talent sourcing for, uh, rural communities. Um, and so, uh, yeah, as they mentioned, um, I have a kind of social impact startup. <laughs> Jake's Pizza is the best, and I will go to war with anybody that wants to debate me on it. Um, but um, yeah, so I have a, a small business called Small Town Vibes. Uh, we called it Small Town Vibes because we realized that when uh, college students thought of rural, they instantly went to, do I have to live on a farm? And what we're trying to really recraft the narrative on is that no, it's, you know, it's, it's main streets, it's people, it's, you know, all of these attractive amenities that just aren't on the radar of uh, young professionals in the Twin Cities. And so um, hopefully we can plant some seeds and really get that conversion rate um, up on people moving out to rural Minnesota. So uh, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to do a quick little uh, snapshot of Handshake, which is um, you know, I'm sure most people are using Indeed or LinkedIn or other things to support their recruiting. Handshake is basically just a much more tailored version of that where it's really targeted at colleges. And so all of the uh, colleges within the state of Minnesota, as far as I'm aware, um, are on Handshake. So it's really efficient way to reach students. Um, and so I just wanted to prime it all on you and then uh, open up some opportunities for collaboration, um, et cetera. But without further ado, I'll kind of jump in there and show you all around. Um, one thing, um, sorry, make sure I get the right window here. Um, one thing I'll ask for is I'm just gonna plant a seed that I'll need a guinea pig in about two to three minutes. So if you are an employer and you have a job posting or a job that you know you'll need in the next uh, six months to a year, keep that in mind because I'll maybe, uh, if you're willing to, um, I'll, uh, I'll have you have you work with me to uh, show how Handshake works. So um, can everybody see my screen right now? Looks good, yep. Okay, cool. Uh, so this is my homepage. This is my company profile for uh, Small Town Vibes on Handshake. Um, it allows you to kind of put forth a really attractive um, imagery, customize, tell your story, so on and so forth. So this is an easy landing page for students to learn more about you um, and things like that. Going to the dashboard, um, and my dashboard is going to be a little bit empty because you know I don't have jobs to place right now. Uh, but just to show you kind of the three main functionalities that you have uh, within Handshake. Uh, obviously, posting jobs is going to be the most relevant and important. Um, so right now I've got a talent sourcing intern, which I'll show you a little bit more about that in a second. Um, you can direct message to request interviews with candidates, and then you can create events to boost your engagement. So uh, for example, last fall, um, Ottertail County, we had a couple of uh engagements that we partnered on i used handshake to source students for attending those events um, and it was really effective um in doing so so what i want to show you all first and this is just going to be i'm going to jump around a little bit and just give a snapshot so it's not going to be a true tutorial uh but if you find yourself thinking hey handshake looks really cool i like the functionality of it but i maybe need a little bit more to get started um want to put that out there please message me and i'm happy to help uh get something set up for you all 
Um, but let's uh, let's jump to talent because that's going to be the most important one um, or the most attractive uh, piece of this. So right now you can see on my talent dashboard, I have access to roughly 200,000 students within um, the, the various networks that I'm connected to through the, the schools and our systems and things like that. Um, so now is where I just want to ask for a volunteer. Is there anybody that's willing to uh, share a position that they know is coming up in the pipeline um, that I can use to, to demonstrate how Handshake works? If we have any takers, feel free to unmute. Otherwise, we can from the county side, we can we can be a guinea pig as well. Yeah, yeah. So Josh, I would say we've got a we always have a sheriff's deputy openings. Can that be a, a guinea pig opportunity? That can be a great guinea pig opportunity, right? So obviously 200,000 is going to be way too big to search from. Um, what I have the ability to do is with each of these students, I can send them messages, I can personalize them, and, and it's got a really good response rate. So let's say we're looking for sheriff's deputy. Um, I can personalize for certain skills, um, either maybe experience with law or law enforcement, uh, apply my filters there. So now I've got 14 highly targeted candidates that I can reach out to. So let's say I like Jaden, um, student at St. Kate's. Um, I want to message them. I can read about their bio, see if that has an attractive uh, story for what we're looking for, um, and then send them a message. And each month, um, if you're on the free plan, you get 100 messages, but if you upgrade, um, you can get more. But then I can say to Jaden, you know, hey, Jaden, um, you know, we're looking for profiles, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you look like a really attractive candidate. Would you like to learn more about our um, opening sheriff's deputy position? Um, and what I found is with this strategy of being able to filter and hone in, um, I get a really good response rate and especially when i'm able to personalize and put their name in there and things like that um it's close to about 50 percent on students responding to to messages that i send them um and the more that you do it the more that you get efficient at it um you can copy and paste and then personalize until you can get through all 14 of these candidates in you know half an hour um and then scale and you know uh get a number of candidates pretty quickly um so yeah, real quick, any questions on um, the talent sourcing or uh, being able to filter and look up? You can also, um, sorry, before I do that, you can also, if you are a little bit more vague and you say, hey, we don't know exactly what our needs, it's more we just want somebody that's talented and interested and we can customize a position to them. You can instead go by major group um, instead of like uh, skills. Um, and you can go by school as well. So for instance, um, one of my favorite partner colleges right now is Dunwoody University. And um, <laughs> I'm uh, having troubles getting rid of the uh, legal enforcement. I might have to come back sometime. Uh, but anyways, I can go by school and I can kind of just see who are my seniors, who are my juniors, who's got um, the most, uh, which positions are coming down the pipeline the most and really cater my uh, messaging, my talent recruitment strategy to um, to that. So um, any questions real quick on talent sourcing or identification? Eric's got his hand raised. Oh, sure, go ahead. So you had mentioned free versus paid. So could you, could you I, I don't wanna take you in a different direction, but could you tell us more about free versus paid? Yeah, yeah. So uh, there's there's actually three tiers within um, Handshake. So there's Handshake Core, Handshake Plus, and Handshake Premium. Um, Handshake Core, that's your free service. You can message 100 times uh, um, per month or send 100 unique messages per month. Um, really, that's what most people need, um, unless you're coming up on, hey, we need somebody by the end of the month. We need to be really um ambitious with this then that's a situation where you might want to upgrade to handshake plus um it is a little bit pricey uh depending on what your uh recruitment budget is but it's 309 a month uh for handshake plus um but um the uh um 
it does allow for uh, more, more automation. You can get a little bit further with your outreach, um, so on and so forth. So, um, but it's definitely more more seasonal. Uh, uh, Handshake Premium, um, I would say that's if you're going to be, uh, you know, medium to large size employer, uh, that allows for a lot of automation. You can send out instead of sending uh, engaging with a specific university once at a time. You can engage with every university in your network simultaneously, so it does really create a lot of efficiency that way. Um, but in, I can maybe show you an example of where that um, creates uh, added opportunities. But um, yeah, good question, Eric. And and if you're if you're somebody and you're curious, hey, I want to get started on Handshake, and this looks, and you just do I go core or go, do I go premium? Um, Start with core, and I would say before you jump into plus, um, have a conversation with me, uh, just because I was doing plus for a little bit. Depending on where you're at in your recruiting cycle, um, you know the uh, return on investment is just lower. Um, but if you're in that really high volume, like I need to get out in front of 500 candidates, you know, tomorrow. Um, that's when plus is going to start having a pay, um, you know, a uh, good return on investment, but yeah, thanks Eric. So jumping back home, um, the other thing that I just wanted to highlight real quick is just your ability to create events that can create an additional value add for, um, students. So let's say, um, we're going to do another happy hour, um, with, uh, uh, Otter Tail County and partner businesses. Um, we're going to focus on hiring and recruiting and networking. I can set my date and um, we're just going to say February 22nd at 5.30 p.m. Um, for the sake of imagination. Oops. Um, apologies. And then um, as you have context in there, it'll be off campus. Sorry, this is kind of the, the tedious part, um, but I wanted to show you uh, where we could um, uh, do some of this customization and targeting. Um, but let's say we're gonna do it at Urban Growler, which is one of my favorite breweries in the Twin Cities. Um, we want a cab registration at 30. Then here's where it gets cool is because you can start to um, target specific schools. So if I know I'm going after a Twin City school, so let's say um, Augsburg University, I know that they've got a really strong um, uh, law enforcement program. So that's where I'm going to go do my event description. Um, then, you know, I can just pull in my um, event description, post it in there and um, update the thumbnail, depending on how you want to do that and save. Now, once this event is in there, um, I can start to invite students to it. I can link to it. I can invite career centers and things like that to help promotion. Um, and that becomes a really effective way to get in front of students, which um, part of part of what I want to stress with the use of handshake and kind of communication strategies is that students within the Twin Cities, they just they're not considering rural right now and so we have to be really thoughtful in terms of getting in front of them and really putting a new narrative in front because right now what most students in handshake and linkedin and things like that are doing is they're looking at the salary of a twin cities position against the salary of a rural position um and obviously just you know the basic economics of that the comparison is almost never gonna look good in that light right um and so what we need to do is we need to figure out different communication strategies to make sure that they're recognizing the various amenities the community the people um all of these things that have a lot of intangible value um that if you get hooked on it then it doesn't matter what the pay discrepancy is as long as you have um you know a wage that supports your family and the lifestyle that you want uh within a rural community but that's where handshake and some of these personalized messaging tools um can really support that. And then last thing I just wanted to highlight for folks um, that I love Handshake for is that Handshake houses a lot of the uh, in-person engagement opportunities with these schools so that you can keep track of opportunities to get face-to-face -face with students, host a table, um, et cetera, which I think especially for 
um, Otter Tail County, when you can put pictures of the lakes, when you can put pictures of the homes, when they can meet uh, the people from Otter Tail, um, that's really what's going to uh, move the needle in terms of students considering it for their um, you know, future lives and careers. And so, um, as you can see, I can filter for my favorite schools. It'll pull up everything that's coming up in the next like six months to a year or anything that's posted. Um, and then it makes it really easy. If I want to go to Carlson and I want a table there, I can see who's attending. Um, I can see students that are committed, which I doubt there's any students committed yet because um, they won't do that until the new year. Um, but then I also have the contact of the um, the the um the host of the event right so then i can go i can set up my table i can get registered for the event um and uh make sure that i get that facetime with students so um real quick i will pause there um with the last note that handshake is a really powerful tool i really encourage all of you to um get on it if you do have any uh hiring needs especially with um college-aged uh students um, and yeah, let me know if you have any questions and I can go jump into different features um, if people want me to follow up on it. Yeah, great information. Thanks, Josh. I know um, in some of our conversations about talent tourism, one of the things that I shared with Josh was when I was in school, I went down to Winona State University and when I was looking for for jobs after graduation and I looked at Handshake, that was a tool that Winona State used as well, but there was I knew that I didn't want to live in the Twin Cities. Um, I knew I wanted to get out of the Twin Cities a little ways, but there wasn't any employers that had opportunities within Handshake. So I think Otter Till County employers have a unique opportunity to be innovative and be kind of that that leading, um, set the example here um, to get those opportunities in there and, and get in front of not just U of M students. Obviously, there's, there's a whole bunch of other schools um, within there as well. So, um, Great information. And I did just want to share to um, keeping in mind our, our local partners as well. Um, and I see Dr. Brimhall is on too, so wanted to give her a shout um, on that too. But there are, you know, several or several different tools that get used um, by, by colleges, by um, our high schools. Um, so Handshake was the one that obviously that Josh just talked about. M State has a platform that they use that I think is a little bit different, but similar functionality. Um, and also a, a mentorship program. So that, again, that yeah, that individualized approach. Um, so looking into that, if you have, uh, as an employer, interested in, in kind of doing the the one-on-one -on -one, um, engagement with students. And then as we've talked about too, regarding some of our youth workforce efforts with the high schools, there's the K-12 Navigator tool too. Um, and getting your uh, as an employer getting listed on there as well. So, um, great information. Um, I do want to. I'm going to skip to our next speaker, and and hopefully we'll have some time here to come at, uh, come back at the end. Um, but Debbie Grant from Rural Minnesota SEP also has some really great information um, on a new newer program for for SEP, and she's the uh, Debbie. I, I can let you introduce yourself as well. Um, but just wanted to highlight. Um, we we if you remember back to last year at the workforce summit uh justice involved or second chance workers were a, an untapped labor pool that we talked about um and so this this program that sep has is a newer program that does kind of target those justice involved people as they're um, re-entering the workforce and so i will turn it over to debbie as she will um, provide us some information about this program so thanks for being here debbie yeah thank you for inviting me i did send you the if you want to pull those up. Yeah, yeah. yep. OK. I did attach uh, information regarding rural Minnesota step for those of you that may not be familiar with us. But we are the private nonprofit partner of the Career Forest Center in 19 counties. So we have eight offices. Um, and I did list the, since the counties as well. But uh, we were given this grant that we applied for. It's a re-entry grant. It's a dislocated worker grant, but it's only designed for justice involved individuals. And it's to help them with wraparound services, one-on-one -on -one career counseling, case management, job search assistance, skills training. Uh, I've been working with individuals from all the counties and 
along with the probation parole officers, the correctional facilities, uh, the different um, boot camps. If you're familiar with those, those are the um, CIP, which is Challenge Incarceration Programs. They're intensive six month programs. And we've been working with them where they've been referring people to our counties and to talk to me and I meet with them uh, virtually prior to their release. The program is designed, I think I have another, it's kind of a summary of who's eligible for this program. And it's designed and focused on justice involved individuals within six months of release till after six months after release. So it's getting them in that window of time and working with them with figuring out what their needs are, where we can assist. Pre-vocational, do they have a goal? Have they worked on that? Depending on where they've been at, it could be county, state, federal, and there's different transitional officers at those locations that work with some of them. Um, in the county, not as much, but we do, it's getting more and more. And I've been working with Becker County uh, transition individual there. So we offer everything from support services that they may need. They may have come out with just one pair of shoes, you know, not a coat. They don't aren't work ready. They may need a resume. They may need to explore careers. Look at the job options. What's their transportation situation? There's a lot of individuals that are coming out that need reinstatement fees. You know, they need help to find out about the interlock or things that they might not have been set up with probation or parole. Just to navigate trying to find second chance employers. I spoke at the workforce summit in Clay County as a presenter regarding this program, just to let them know. And they had a virtual job fair as well as in person. And I was able to connect with all those employers that are desperately looking you know, for employees and uh, and spoke with virtually with individuals that are incarcerated. So um, before their release and letting them know this is a Minnesota grant. And it's focused in the area, like I had mentioned, it, it is designed only for justice involved. So it's working together with all the services that may be out there, giving them resources, helping them. Um, I had one individual. Ten years ago, he has started a welding training, but life got in the way and he was incarcerated. He came out and that's what he wanted to do. He didn't want just any job. And we talk about the ABCs. First, they need any job, either for early release or to stay released. Then look for the better job. And after that, it's a career. And he, that's what he wanted. And I worked with the service he was working with. And we were able to provide the training, get him his work boots, get him his safety kit, pay for the tuition. And he went from not having a job. And after six weeks of this class, he really wanted a job because he had children. He was living in a halfway house and wanted to support. And I referred him to one of these employers and said, give him my card or, you know, mention my name. He'd already been turned down by somebody else and they interviewed him. He passed the certification test and now he's making $24 an hour. An example is the case manager said he's never seen in six years an individual personality change to, to go from not talking, not communicating, head down to smiling and joking and positive about his future and life. And finally realizing he did get a second chance. So we will assist with that. We help with OJTs on the job training where we work with employers to reimburse wages up to 50% for a period of three to six months. So helping them, the employer out, as well as the individual we're working with. So some of the things, like I said, you have to be a Minnesota resident, you had to have lived in Minnesota or worked in Minnesota prior to incarceration. So that is the main, I am out of the Moorhead area. So we're bordered with North Dakota. So it's trying to 
I'm getting a lot of calls from the North Dakota side because <laughs> the word's getting out and I have to explain that this is for Minnesota residents. But we're border, so we have Minnesota residents that are residing on the North Dakota side temporarily. So I've had individuals that have been incarcerated for six months up to 12 years. And it's really been a big change for a lot of them, even accepting what happened to the grocery prices, you know, because they had technology as far as the phones and everything else. So they're adjusting to a lot of things of reentry. So if we can provide those supports to help them navigate things, what kind of insurance? SR22. What does that mean? I explained that, but give them the handout. I've had individuals calling me from other areas in the state. And so I found out, okay, who's up in the Duluth area? There's a lot down in the cities that are part of this reentry grant. Our reentry grant is called Restoring Connections because it truly is an all from housing to transportation to employment to if they need to be on, you know, connect them up with the county for SNAP, things of that nature. So does anybody have any questions? Any questions? The one sheet, or... Yeah, and Sarah is going to be sending that information out yep. um, to you, including all the counties that are involved with this. Yeah. Trying to talk it... fast because I know we're out of time. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Debbie. No, that was a great overview. And um, it's always good to just know what resources are out there. Um, Eric, I did see you had a question or your hand raised. Go ahead. I, and sorry to sorry to uh, take up all the question time. I, I don't know if I'm allowed to per session, but uh, uh, thanks for this information. And and if you don't know the answer to this, I'm, I don't want to put you on the spot. But so if if the answer is I don't know, that's that's fine. But is there any way to quantify the opportunity? Like, in, in, if you if if you could sprinkle some pixie dust and and every employer came to you, like how many people are in this pool of of eligible workforce? Does that make sense? Like, is it is it a hundred? Is it five thousand? Is it you know how many how many willing and able bodies are there that that you think could help employers address their workforce shortage ballpark ish we're focused on 38 that's what we individuals in our 19 counties that's based on the amount of the grant and how intensive we wanted to do full intensive wraparound not just do a light touch and be on your way we offer working with them we do have in detroit lakes coming up on monday We've got Deed coming down to do the new LEAF job search workshop. Those are only the only ones that can attend that are justice involved to remove barriers. When I reached out to uh, Willow River, which is one of the boot camps, and I send all the information out and, and talk to her, and she's like, I have 119 individuals that are going to be going right to those counties. The Togo, what I've had which is up in way up north, the boot camp there. And I saw an email just came up from him. And so he sends referrals to me and they're doing some pre-app stuff. I've met with them before the release. So, and just since we started this grant, the end of May, we now have had like 16 referrals from just that place. I reached out to Stillwater to find out they had rotating around 60 individuals every month and just knowing getting the information out it's a yeah. huge it's huge and so more employers because they're lacking employees they're willing to give chances a lot more and realizing these are individuals that want to work when it, i have with working with individuals that are justice involved and i have for years including youth at the regional juvenile center um, the appreciation it's it's overwhelming because what people think of ah, it's um they are so appreciative. I hear it over and over and over uh, from the same person. I said, all right already. But they are so grateful because we're not just, you know, talking the talk, you know, and I I feel great to have this opportunity 
how do you help these individuals? And I'm just watching them thrive, not just strive, but you know, thrive. Yeah, yeah, and a and a great you know impact that not only you get to work with those individuals, but also that like Eric was saying that it makes a difference for those employers too to be able to work with individuals that are overcoming those barriers, um, and then finding successful and gainful employment, and and it's it's really a win win for everyone. Um, so yeah, really great information, and and we'll make sure I'm just going to share my screen here one more time as we're wrapping up. Um, so like I mentioned, we'll make sure we'll share um, all the contact information, um, you know, specifically on this on this Restoring Connections program uh, with SEP. Feel free to reach out to, to Debbie. Um, but anything else, any other programs that SEP offers, like Debbie mentioned, you know, on the on the job training, um, some of those other efforts that they're that they're doing, always feel free to reach out to them as well. Um, so if if folks do have any questions, I know we're one minute over, so want to be you know respectful of people's time. Um, we'll make sure that all of this follow up information gets out there in addition to a recording of of today's convening. Um, but appreciate everyone hopping on. Um, we can stay on, I think, for a couple of minutes as as well as maybe a couple of our speakers um, if you do have any questions. But if not, thanks again for everyone who joined. Um, we look forward to these every quarter and and always feel free to reach out. Um, if you do have any questions and then one final plug to um, I referenced our workforce summit last fall uh, we're, we're going to start planning here for another one in the, sp in the spring no major you know confirmed details yet but just watch for that information um, and we'll we'll continue to share a lot of this great information and a lot of that will be featured at this workforce summit here in the spring too so thanks for everyone who hopped on um, and and have a great rest of your day maybe go get some ice cream enjoy the warm weather um, and have a great day. Bye-bye.